Okay. Yeah, so on that note, Nishka, if you want to get started, uh, we'll get things going. Thank you, Kathleen. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the LBSA for our final book club meeting of the year and the first that we've opened up externally to the public. I'm so honored to announce that we have an incredible guest speaker, esteemed lawyer, and an all around impactful individual joining us tonight, uh, Marie Hennen. We are so happy you are joining us today. My name is Nishka. I'm the president of the LBSA. And before we begin, I did want to give you all a heads up that this event is recorded, as Kathleen said, for educational purposes, and we encourage attendee engagement. If you would like to turn on your cameras, please feel free to do so. However, please remain unmuted while the speakers are tonight are speaking. I do want to note that we do have questions prepared for tonight in this moderated discussion. However, please feel free to share your questions in the chat box or raise your hand and an LBSA member will direct you to unmute. Please be aware to keep your questions respectful. So before we get the ball rolling, it is critical that the LBSA highlights a series of acknowledgements to the marginalized communities that this organization is aligned with. To start, I will begin acknowledging the indigenous land wherein this event takes place upon. Ted Rogers School of Management located in downtown Toronto is located in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. At this time, we would like to take the moment of to reflect and acknowledge the heinous crimes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way, try and move forward in a spirit of reconciliation, collaboration and respect. I would also like to take the time to share the LBSA social injustice statement. The LBSA is committed to fostering a safe and inclusive environment for all members, students and staff. We stand firmly against any and all forms of racism and discrimination. The LBSA stands in solidarity through the continued fight against social, racial, and gender-based injustice as we continue to prioritize equity and diversity both in internally and externally to our organization. Without further ado, we will jump in right into our moderated discussion. It is my pleasure to pass it off to our general associate and an individual who has headstrong this in initiative since the beginning. Uh, Jacob, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Nishka. Uh, Marie, again, thank you so much for joining us. Let's sort of just get right into it um, about the book itself, nothing but the truth that I have right here. Um, what inspired you to write this book and, and really share your story and what was your process behind that? Well, I, you know, I have, uh, I had been asked to write a book for quite some time and really didn't want to do that because uh, I'm a pretty private person. Uh, and didn't want to write about my cases. Uh, as I say in the book, you know, when a client comes to you, uh, it is an incredibly difficult experience. And I, I don't think anybody, whether it's a client or a witness who I cross-examined, would like me then to have them relive that entire experience in a book. So uh, I, I really didn't want to uh, write that, just wasn't in me to do it. Um, but after a while, uh, there were things that I did want to say, uh, and one of the biggest driving uh, forces for me to write the book, ultimately, was that, you know, when you become a public person and nobody trains you to do that in law school, and it's certainly not in your, certainly wasn't in my life plan, uh, you have certain obligations, and I think uh, the image that was being portrayed uh, is very caricature particularly of uh, a female lawyer. Uh, and I thought it would be uh, very disheartening for uh, people to look at what they were seeing on TV and think, you know, you had to be super tough or you had to, you know, do a particular thing or be a particular way to be successful in this profession. So, you know, I thought it was very important to give a more rounded um, perspective of who I am, flaws and all, uh, so that uh, people could see the commonality and hopefully be inspired and see how accessible it is. Uh, you know, when people would come to me and say, oh, you gotta write your book because it's so extraordinary. I'd always say, it's actually not an extraordinary story. It's a very common story of many people in this country and many immigrants. And uh, that was the perspective I wrote the book with that uh, it is my story. I mean, I happen to be the one giving voice to it. It is a story I hope that many of us share. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, in terms of the name of the book itself, uh, you know, I have my own idea of why you called it that, but why would you, why would you say it's specifically called nothing but the truth? Well, it, I, I wish I could tell you I was the clever person that came up with it, but there were a bunch of us trying to figure out 
uh, names, uh, all sorts of names. Um, and that one resonated just because it's sort of the mantra that you hear when people are sworn in, that they're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, so that was obviously uh, relevant to the type of work that I do. Uh, but also to give the, the reader a sense of what was coming, which was that it was going to be a little bit raw and uh, maybe not what they were expecting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, you know, for some, you know, based on their personality, I guess, and what they're used to, um, you know, they have different comfort zones and, and, and arguments in cases that's maybe your comfort zone uh, and what you're obviously good at and, and would you say that writing a book was stepping out of your comfort zone or uh, you know the writing part was uh, a challenge for sure because I'm not a, a, a writer and I'd never written uh, other than my thesis <laughs> my master's thesis anything in this this long a form um, but uh, the most challenging part of it in terms of stepping out of my comfort zone was having to share so much of my personal life. You know, often I would give chapters to my editor and he'd, you know, he'd call me and say, okay, like, where are you in the chapter? Because uh, if I could have written the book without mentioning myself, I would have preferred it. Uh, so I found it very, I found that very, very difficult to do. Um, that, that was the most challenging thing. I see. Um, and, and so from your experience with Nothing But The Truth, what would you say is your favorite and least favorite parts of the public, the whole publishing process, I guess you could say, from the conceptual process to, uh, you know, it going into stores? Um, my least favorite part probably is the very beginning, uh, not to start writing, but because you just don't have a sense of um, how it's going to all turn out and where it's going to end. Uh, so that was probably my least favorite part. And then the, the second least favorite part was the anxiety around it being published and, and what the response would be and, uh, you know, that, that people would look at it and I hope would find it readable and enjoyable to read, but I didn't know. Um, that, was, that was something that made me, um, made me nervous. So that was my least favorite part. My, my most favorite part, again, too, uh, one, the completed product, because, you know, you feel obviously it's a very uh, tangible thing that you've done. Um, and I felt good about that. Uh, and then the, the response I've had has been really, really meaningful to me and, and lovely. And, and so uh, that's been that's been amazing. I'm going to jump in. Can we? Question. Yeah. Um, because in the book, you mentioned there's quite a discrepancy about, you know, how how much space men get to speak about their own experiences. You draw on like the, the differences between interruptions, even on Supreme, for Supreme Court judges, the difference between females and males in that capacity. So what would you say to other women who want to tell their story? Because right off the bat, you're like, if I could could have left myself out of it, I would have. And it's it's very easy as women in the industry to kind of like, no, maybe not. I don't want to, I don't need to talk about myself, yeah. but those stories are so important. So what would well, you they, say they, to inspire more? At the well, I mean, I would encourage, obviously, for, for people to, to tell their stories. Um, and, you know, the reason I wanted to leave myself out of it is just because I'm a private person. Um, that's just a, a, a personality trait that I, I just don't like sort of sharing parts of myself, which you have to if you're going to write a, a memoir, apparently, I learned. Um, but in, in terms of the, the voice of women, you know, that's a really good point. And one of the things that I really flagged early on with my editor and my publisher that, you know, when you look at the way women um, are encouraged to write books, it's always this transformative story. It's always this, you know, rising from the ashes. It's always correcting and fixing. And so one of the things that I actually said very early on was that's not this story. And that's why the story actually begins and ends pretty much in the same place, because, you know, I think we're just fine the way we are. And uh, I don't think we have to constantly go through this regeneration and reassessment and overhaul of, of who we are as women. And I think there is a tendency to, to want that from you, that, that you know, that you got to have the big flaw, you got to have the big recovery, you got to have the big um, moment where you're exposed in, in some sort of way, whereas men really don't ever have to do that. Uh, they're allowed to tell their story in a, a very uh, proud and, and victorious way, actually. And you never see men talking about the massive transformation they have to go through. Uh, and the phrase I used is, is really like this, this idea that we're always a phoenix rising from the ashes is not my story because, you know, I think I was fine the way I started. That doesn't mean I'm not flawed. I am. But 
I'm pretty good with who I am. Uh, maybe that's because of my age. And I think women really need to feel that that confidence in themselves and that acceptance that they are okay the way that they are. And we don't have to constantly be bending ourselves at a shape or showing to the world that look at look at how much I've changed. Um, and that was a very important message for me to convey. And that's why it was very deliberate that, you know, I started it that way saying, look, if you're looking for transformation, you're not going to find it here. And at the end, that's sort of where I ended as well. Um, because I think we're we're pretty good the way we are. Um, and I don't think we owe it to the world to constantly be reassessing ourselves, which doesn't mean you're not introspective. Obviously you are and we grow and all of that, but that real need for you to um, to sort of tear yourself down for the world. Uh, I don't like that. And I don't, I don't think that is something that we women need to do. Absolutely. Uh, Kathleen, did you want to take away some questions as well, or I can keep going, whatever. Yeah, for sure. That was a great insight. And, um, you touched on, you know, you have a bit of confidence there with your age and kind of having learned that over time. Um, but then also you've addressed kind of the ageism, um, for women sure. in the legal industry and how they are aged out almost or start well not just i mean not the legal industry the world really <laughs> it, it, it is quite stunning to see you know I, I talk about those statistics of women in hollywood where they actually are literally silenced but when you look at the the amount of speaking roles they get as they get older even if it's it's about a female character it it get they get silenced um and you are removed because i mean the, the answer is obvious because our value is so tied to our uh, our youth and our appearance um that is unfortunately um the value that's placed so once that's gone um you really get silenced and what's interesting is you know my colleagues who are really powerful tough chicks that are you know incredible every one of them who was turning 50 had that same feeling of like, wow, I'm actually completely irrelevant now. Um, and even my publisher, it's sort of funny because I, when I was writing the 50 and over chapter, he said, I don't know if anyone's going to think that's relevant. I said, you know, that is such a common theme. I mean, when they're saying um, Jennifer Lopez for 50, who's the most stunning person on the, and even she, her age has to be identified. None of us have a shot. And I said to him, look at every single time a woman is referenced with her age. And after he did, he now constantly emails me about it because you can't miss it. Once you're sort of directed to it, uh, you see how prevalent it is that we're we're aged out, we're we're you know silenced and and what we're assessed by. Um, and I I did want to share that because you know I think it for me anyway. I'm certainly not graceful about it. I don't like it, um, and I'm not going to pretend that I like it. So. What are some things that you can be, you think can be done throughout the industry to kind of change that perspective and, and break that mold a little bit? Well, you know, that that's a great question. And again, one of the things I, I sort of wrestled with, because I know we have all of this positivity where we try to wrap our arms around each other and support each other, and that's phenomenal. But, you know, to a certain extent, we're not the cause of the problem, right? We, we are not the ones who are silencing ourselves. Like, we know our value. And it really, I think we have to think long and hard about making the other half of the population and, and society recognize the value in women. Um, and that, you know, that's a hard thing um, to do. I think part of it is to adjust um, people's perspectives of us. That's why I talk about our visibility being very, very important so that it is not unusual to see women or, or uh, racialized people in certain positions. It becomes it becomes what your expectation is, right? You, I think you have to adjust social expectations and you do that by adjusting social norms. Uh, and I don't think it's just, it, it's enough for us just to be supporting ourselves amongst ourselves. Cause you know, as I said, we're not the problem. We're actually not the cause of the problem. Um, and so we have to be a little bit more outward facing, I think. Is there any advice you would give to young females looking to go into the legal industry or like you've mentioned, really any sure. industry as to how they can avoid falling into that mindset or speak up and advocate for themselves as they do get older? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing and the thing that is often uh, I find most lacking and it makes me very sad is self-confidence. 
Um, and self-confidence really comes from a variety of things. One is a recognition of your own value and your contribution and what you have to give. You know, if you are waiting for somebody to validate you, man, you're going to be waiting an awfully long time. I would have waited an awfully long time uh, for people to say, you know what, I think you can do this or, you know, I think uh, I think highly of you. Um, so I never fortunately and it's you know part of i try to explain that because of my upbringing and my my mom and just the way i perceived who i was i never waited for that i didn't i didn't think that i really cared about what other people's opinions were i knew what i could do i i, and I was going to show you and the worst that was going to happen is i would fail and then i try again i i just i wasn't going to calibrate my sense of self by what other people think and I think for women in particular, it is so important to keep that message in mind because, you know, most of the commentary directed isn't designed to uh, uplift you. It isn't designed to elevate you. It isn't designed to, to support you and to advance you. And so, you know, if you have to look externally, you're going to be waiting a very long time and it's quite precarious. I think you have to really look for that self-confidence internally. You know your value, you know your skill, you know what you bring to the table. Um, and as I tell young lawyers, if you're not confident, then why would a client feel confident uh, in you? You know, can you imagine a doctor who came in and before they performed surgery said, oh, I'm really nervous about this. I'm not sure I'm good enough to do it. You'd be out of there. You'd say, okay, no, thanks. I don't, I'm not going to trust you. So if you don't trust yourself, if you don't have confidence in yourself, you cannot ask other people to place that confidence in you. So from two perspectives, from one that it's important for your ability to, to find your way through to know your value. And from a very practical business sense that if you want someone to have confidence in you, you have to have confidence in yourself and you have to convey that. Um, that's the most important lesson I, I think young lawyers um, need to remember. In terms of advocating for yourself, you know, you can advocate in a lot of different ways. And, you know, again, that's why I wrote the book. I'm an aggressive person, but I'm an aggressive person by nature, right? That's not something I developed. I was like that when I was five and six, and I'll be like that on my deathbed. That's just the way I'm made. That's not necessarily the most effective, and it's not the zone everyone has to have. Um, Mark Rosenberg, who... Um, passed away uh, and was an extraordinary lawyer and extraordinary judge was very low key. He was a very quiet, understated, but profoundly resolute and compelling person uh, and tough. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I surround myself by people who I think are incredibly strong, but incredibly strong isn't equated with incredibly aggressive. I, you know, some people have just different speeds. So I think you can advocate and assert yourself in the way that works for you. But the way you do it, I think is up to you. The most important thing that will cause you to do it is your sense of self-worth. Um, and and that's, that's the driver that will cause you to say, okay, I'm gonna draw the line. Now how you express how you're gonna draw the line or how you're gonna articulate your, your boundaries, you will do it in the way that works for you, that's comfortable for you. Um, but you won't even get there if you don't if you don't feel confident in yourself, if you don't know what your what your value is. That was a great answer. I'll throw it over to you, Jacob. I'm sure you have some. some yeah, I was just going to uh, expand off of uh, you were just talking about um, sorry, sort of your influences. Um, and, and so Eddie Greenspan, I want to look more into that. Uh, you were talking about in your book, you know, what you had hoped to do after law school and that it was always to work with Eddie Greenspan. Uh, and that you said, uh, and I quote, you know, he was the quintessential criminal defense lawyer, 100% pure, undiluted and quirky as hell. Um, okay. and, and so you say, and so now, you know, you've mentioned your admiration for him. How does it make you feel to know that, you know, other lawyers and law students and, and students out there view you as their own Eddie Greenspan? <laughs> I, wow, um, not expected, uh, not, not in the, it wasn't in the, the big plan for sure. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, it's, uh, it makes me feel obviously uh, very, um, confident in my choice of career, I would say. Um, and it makes me feel uh, a responsibility uh, to um, those people that are looking to you uh, to either come into this profession or looking to you for some, some sense of self. Um, 
And that's very meaningful. I, you know, again, that is one of the reasons that I, I wrote the book because I wanted people who were looking to look at all of it. I, I wanted them to sort of see uh, a bit of a fuller picture. So um, it, it's very meaningful to me. And I, I think it adds a whole other um, dimension to my career that I hadn't anticipated and opportunity to, I think, do things and reach people in a way that is amazing. Um, and just, as I said, I just had never thought that that was how it was gonna play out. Absolutely. Uh, and you also uh, spoke very fondly in the book of Eddie's firm partner, the late uh, Mark Rosenberg. Uh, mm -hmm. And although he was an appellate lawyer, I believe, um, yeah. was there anything that you picked up or learned from him that contributed or influenced how you now defend or handle your cases? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, for my, for the most of my early part of my career, and by that I mean probably the first six or seven years, I did pre predominantly appellate work, not trial work. Um, so I was doing a lot of the appeal work, uh, not only writing for Mark, but then when he left the office, uh, inheriting that appellate practice. I was junioring to Eddie for, and so I'd have some of my own cases, but mostly second chair to Eddie for seven, eight years. I mean, that, that was my life. And I always say to young lawyers that uh, the, the two uh, practices were absolutely complementary. Uh, doing appellate work taught me things that um, I needed to learn and get better at because when I went into the practice of law as a young student, I thought, you know, I love the law, but I don't care about facts. I, I really don't. Why They're sort of interfering with my grand thinking about law, I thought. And if you practice appellate practice, which um, you think is all about the law, it actually is not. It's really grounded in the minutiae of the facts. It really is. And it's stunning to learn that. Um, and I learned that because you would adjust how you developed your oral arguments when you saw what was compelling and what was not. Now, I'm talking about the Court of Appeal because at the Supreme Court, it's a bit of a different style of argument and different issues and broader, not, not fact specific. But at the Court of Appeal, it is very, very fact specific. So it forced me in reading tons and tons of transcripts to really focus on details. So, you know, it was a really important education. But the other thing is you become very proficient in the law and you learn how in a trial to look down the road to an appeal. So you're setting up for, a, at, in your trial, you're always looking at the possibility of a loss. And so you're setting up your grounds of appeal. I would not have known how to do that, but for an extensive appellate, um, appellate practice. So the two really go hand in hand for me. And I think the best lawyers um, are lawyers that do both. And in our firm, you know, we have lawyers like my partner, Scott, um, who came from 720 Bay, an appellate crown, does appeals and trials. You know, Danielle does, Matt does, Christine does. I mean, most of the lawyers um, do both in our firm. And I think it just makes you a much, much better lawyer. Absolutely. I wanted to look, <clears throat> excuse me, more into uh, your book, of course. And you talk a lot about uh, your uncle, Sammy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's this one part that I love. And you say that, you know, he would do your makeup and dress you up in, in your mom's clothes. Uh, sure. and, and you were, you know, so short and small at the time that looked like gowns on you. Um, and, and so, you know, you talk about his makeup, his makeup style and everything like that. Uh, and you have a very unique sense of fashion now. Would you say that playing dress up with your uncle Sammy and, and him himself uh, oh, yeah. influenced the way that you dress now and, and how that applies to the career and just everything? Oh yeah, no, a hundred percent. I mean, first of all, my grandmother was a seamstress and so she always loved fashion. We had a clothing store that was, you know, glitter was everywhere. Uh, my mother, uh, I showed some of the pictures in the book, was like a fashionista beyond. Um, everything was, uh, she would make it and, and she was obsessed with it. And then my Uncle Sammy, totally obsessed with it. And, you know, well into um, uh, university, you know, he would go and buy fabric in New York and then we'd come back and, and have something made. I, you know, I was always obsessed with it, but it was because I was surrounded by it. For us, it was natural. We love it. Um, it, it's fun. Um, and so that, that, that's not a thing that sort of developed late in my life. Uh, it, it's always been a, a part of my life and a part of my family's life. 
Uh, and Sammy for sure. I mean, I was going to Bloomingdale's and Macy's and not Bergdorf's now, yes, but not then. Um, with him and Fiorucci's, I just saw an Andy Warhol um, uh, auction and they had a, a picture of him standing in front of Fiorucci's, which was this very funky uh, place in New York, uh, clothing and trash and vaudeville in the East Village. Like that was just my life. I was, it's real. It, that's how I grew up and I love it. Out of curiosity, did you go see Andy Warhol's uh, AGO exhibit? No, I saw the I saw Andy Warhol's exhibit um, uh, in in New York actually. Oh well, um, even better probably. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah, it was a I, they had a a, a big exhibit um, and it was it was very cool. Yeah, um, more about. I'm just going to jump in quickly just to remind everybody on the call. It's a fantastic opportunity. If you have questions yourself, throw them into the um, into the chat box. You don't want to miss the chance to ask a question for sure. Um, but I'll throw it back over to you, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, about New York specifically, um, you know, you write about that city with such great love and, and admiration, like you said, and extravaganza right. and, and glitter. Is that what drew you to apply and complete your master's at Columbia University or? Yes. That's <laughs> exactly why. I, I wish I could say it was much more sophisticated than that. I just wanted to live in New York. Um, but by the time I got there, obviously, Sammy wasn't there. And it wasn't the same experience for me as it had been. Um, and I, I found that a bit difficult, to be honest. I, I found the, being there without him very difficult. And um, I, I just, I felt like a little bit of a, a fish out of water in Columbia, which was you know, a lot of students who are outgoing and I know it'll come as a surprise, I'm not actually. Uh, and so I, it, was a, it was an interesting environment, but remember when I'm going to New York and what I know it, it is very different, right? I, I'm going to the Pyramid nightclub and trash and vaudeville in the East Ville. Like I'm doing something very different than Columbia. And so that was always my image of New York. And then you're in this environment and um, and he was not there. And it was very, uh, it took a bit of an adjustment. But, uh, you know, I've never stopped loving the city. And um, so we're there all the time. That's great. Um, you also talk about uh, politics a lot and you say, you know, you had an interest in politics, which you shared with your father. And uh, you say our love over uh, a lo our love of arguing over anything, the desire to outmatch each other in, a, in any debate, the love of literature um, and being more persuasive than the other is a sport for us, you say. Uh, yeah. And so you mentioned that love for politics and literature. And do you think those sort of debates with your father um, contributed to you becoming a litig litigator? I, I think so. I think, uh, you know, part of it is very much, um, you know, as I write in this book, uh, I did not know that my dad wanted to be a lawyer until I was sort of well on the way. Uh, but, you know, surprising that I missed it, obviously, because he is a very great debater. We would debate all the time. Um, you know, that verbal sparring was, I grew up with that. That was just common in our household between my dad and I in particular. And um, I, I think that was part of it. I, I think that, and I don't know, it, it's not that it was, I was directed to it. It wasn't like he said, go be a lawyer. I always wanted to be a lawyer. It was just a natural thing. It was, um, uh, just the way we interacted and I think a real natural love and I always say he would have been a phenomenal lawyer he would have been a phenomenal um, oralist and uh, it's unfortunate he didn't get to follow what his true love was. We have a quick question from the audience here um, so what motivated you to choose criminal defense law and go into into that area? Sure. Uh, well, you know, there were a few things. And as I, uh, I said in the book, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer very early on, which does not mean, by the way, if you don't know what area of law you want to practice, that you're not going to be uh, successful and fabulous and that you won't find it. You will. Everyone has dramatically different paths. But for me, I'll, I'll tell you what was um, a factor. Uh, one was uh, my personality. Uh, you know, I, I was struggling between, did I want to go into medicine, which is what most of my dad's family was, uh, or law. And for me, my personality was more suitable to, to law. I was just naturally a litigator. I like oral argument. I like debate. And, and I knew that early on. So that when I thought of, well, what's my life going to be like? 
Did I want to be sitting at a desk? Did I want to be in an operatory? Did I want, I, I, I didn't want any of that. I, I know I wanted to be out and trying to persuade and arguing. So that was one thing. Uh, the second thing is very early on, it was evident to me that my inclination was always uh, to be defense oriented in the sense that if there was an underdog, it was my instinct to take that position. I, I always took the contrary position. I'm not a party line person. I'm not a toe the party line. If there's a party line, you know, I'm not going to toe it. It was just the way I am. Maybe I'm naturally oppositional. I don't know. Um, and so that was where I was leaning always was, you know, towards defense. And then, you know, as you get a little bit more sophisticated in your thinking, you think about the, the, the breadth of what the criminal law canvases. And it, it really is, uh, focused on our on so many complicated things how we organize ourselves as a society or our sense of morality uh, the evolution that we go through which is quite fascinating um socially in terms of what's acceptable and what's not and all of that plays out in what we sanction right and and what we criminalize and our approach even to punishment is really reflective of who we are as a society i found all of that very fascinating so it just was for me the right fit. And I, I intuitively knew that it was the right place for me. I, I never wavered from that. I never thought of anything else. Uh, I never thought I'd wanna go to the Crown's office. I didn't apply to a Crown position or any other position other than six or seven criminal defense firms. I, I, I mean, I was that focused on, on the job. I just knew it's what I wanted to do. If I can just expand on that, thank you so much for that. Uh question. Um, in regards to criminal law, what advice would you share um, with those, you know, interested in, in following your footsteps uh, and going in that sort of field, but who may feel a little, let's say, hesitant or, or discouraged after seeing, you know, some of the harsh feedback that you've received from the public? Yeah, well, I, you know, that's, that's one of the, the most concerning parts of the harsh feedback, I have to say. Um, it's not that it affected me because you probably figured out I could care less, um, but that what it was doing was sending a really awful message to a lot of people because what they're saying is that's that's how you're going to be dealt with and that's how you're going to get treated. And that is profoundly discouraging um, and equally discouraging is that there wasn't a louder um, response from various institutions uh, like our law society saying, uh, a defense lawyer doing this job and a female defense lawyer doing this job is not only entirely appropriate, it's part of our system and it should be respected, not denigrated personally. Uh, so it is uh, really unfortunate that people saw that. Um, I hope some of that has turned around. Uh, you know, I think we have a responsibility as lawyers in particular to interact with the public and to talk to them about what we do to explain what we do and why we do it and how our system is organized. Um, and I think when you do have those conversations, people have uh, uh, are prepared to hear it out and are prepared to be educated a little bit about the system. And I think when they learn about what we're trying to do and what your role is, um, instead of just getting the information from TV, um, they, they, they respect what you do. And so I hope that conversation has occurred since that sort of criticism and that um, you know, I, I've been able to have some of those conversations and, and, and just be a little bit more transparent about what it is I'm doing and why you're doing it and why you take the role that you do and what drives you to do it. Um, but it is unfortunate. And, you know, on that point, Jacob, uh, I think I've got a question which ties into this, which is the Barrett Jackson confirmation hearings in the United States and, and what I think, um, um, of what's gone on there. Um, and they're, they're nothing short of outrageous. Um, you know, it's outrageous when I wanna write about it uh, because it, it is, uh, you know, it, not only is it offensive, um, the, the, the way they've interacted with her as a woman and as a racialized woman who is, you know, head and shoulders and intellect about any, above anyone asking her those questions, by the way, that's obviously clear, but, one of the things that's occurring is that the attack is directed at her role as a defense lawyer, that she represented Guantanamo Bay detainees, uh, that she acted in the public defender's office. A lot of the attack has been on her work as a defense lawyer. 
And I find that absolutely disheartening and stunning to see. Um, she attempts as best she can to try to explain what her role is and the importance of it. And at the same time goes out of her way to explain um, that she is not her client and why she does what she does. Uh, but, you know, I think much of it fell on deaf ears and it was extremely, extremely disheartening that as this was going on, this attack on her, that people didn't recognize what was really also being attacked was the justice system, the, the foundations of democracy, um, the challenge to government. You know, the, the, these people who stormed the Capitol, by the way, who are opposed to government, um, who is it that defends them and defends their rights to be out there protesting, even if you don't agree at all with what they're saying? They didn't understand how you reconcile all of these freedoms with these, the justice system and the role of a lawyer in the justice system in protecting those freedoms. To attack a lawyer for defending Guantanamo Bay detainees is um, outrageous. But I will tell you this, that early on when we also passed uh, legislation in the wake of 9-11 and it went to the Supreme Court and we were uh, challenging it and uh, you know I intervened and, and was uh, challenging as well, you know, one of the things I said was, you know, it's not that terrorism is extraordinary in the sense that we've never experienced it. Some countries live with it quite frequently, actually. It's our response to it when it dared to come to our shores, when all of a sudden uh, we reacted. And I have to say that I think part of that reaction is uh, was driven uh, by racism as well, um, because the, you did not have the same reactions to other forms and acts of terrorism. Um, and the lawyers that were representing um, people that were charged with terrorism offenses early on, um, so in the wake of 9-11, were vilified, were, were you know, really vilified by, um, by the public for doing their job until we then started seeing Hollywood movies about detainees that shouldn't have been detained in Guantanamo Bay. And then all of a sudden people realized, wow, that there were people there that shouldn't have been there and that the lawyers were there uh, doing a very important job. And yet she gets asked about her work in representing Guantanamo Bay detainees and um, it, Lindsey Graham storms off. And uh, anyway, it, it was nothing short of outrageous on, on so many levels um, and very disappointing and emblematic of the type of discussion and intellect we have in government currently. Absolutely. Um, I, I wanted to look more about uh, and talk about how, you know, you said that you're not, you know, maybe directly affected or care about some of the beliefs of, of the public that, that they say that what you do or your position is wrong, that as a female you do this and um, but, you know, some believe that that public opinion can matter in a, in a more legal sense, in that, you know, some believe like some legal scholars say that, you know, it has an effect on judges in how their ultimate decision in court is, is you know, it's, it can be biased um, from that public opinion and that it sways their, their um, you know, their application of the law, if you will, and, and their decision. So do you think that's true? Uh, like, to what extent do you believe that public opinion can pose a threat to the intended objective thinking of uh, judges? And, and what can we do to address that influence? That's a great question, Jacob. So two, two points there that, that I think we have to tease out. One is, uh, should judges, judges respond to that, number one? And number two, uh, what role does public opinion have to uh, play in, in the legal system? Is it, is it relevant or is it utterly irrelevant? So let me deal with the easier question, which is the judges should not be persuaded under any circumstances by uh, the banging at the courthouse door, they have to decide, I'm talking about criminal, they have to decide the case on the evidence that they hear before them, not what popular sentiment is. And my experience has been that fortunately in this country, uh, our judges are profoundly independent and, and principled and will make decisions that they feel are, are correct. There have been some judges that have gone off the rails and it's very evident when you read their judgments that what they're doing is 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 pandering to that that public opinion. But I think that is not the majority at all. And uh, you know, often I tell clients that that you can feel confident that your judge will decide the case based on the evidence. That doesn't mean they'll give you the result you want, but that they will be able to resist 
um, the intensity of emotion. And there are many, many examples of that, many cases in this country where judges have done, done their job as they should in an impartial way. On the question of um, public opinion and does it sort of have any impact, it does actually, it does have an impact and it should have an impact. Uh, but not in the way that people think. Uh, it's not about persuading or insisting that you get a, a, a judgment going a particular way in a particular case. That is not, to me, the value of public opinion. But the value of public opinion when we are talking about broader issues, so let's talk about legalization of marijuana, for example. Public opinion and public attitude had a great, and advocacy had a great deal to do with that. The same with the legalization of prostitution the same with abortion laws being decriminalized, uh, the same with the, the removal of a lot of homophobic legislation from the criminal code that criminalized uh, that sort of se sexual activity. That was driven by uh, public opinion and public lobbying and you know, that activism to um, change people's uh, assumptions. And that gets heard by the court. And the, and the way it gets heard is not by tweets, um, it's not by tweets. It's that there is a movement and then there's research and then there, there is interveners and organizations that come and litigate these issues and bring a different perspective to them. And I think that is really important. And so many uh, times in criminal law, you see our current society, albeit slowly, being reflected in, um, in, in the court's ultimate judgments. So I think that is important. Uh, and I think uh, the, the public has a, a very important role to play. I mean, those are it's our society and our criminal laws, and and we should be speaking out about it. But at the same time, you know, when it's coming to uh, to a single case and people's opinion about whether someone's guilty or innocent, whether they're entitled to a defense or not, no, I, I have no time for that. Uh, it doesn't add to the debate. Uh, and, you know, unless you're the judge listening to all the evidence, uh, your opinion really shouldn't be the thing that that sways how a case is decided. Absolutely. That was such a great answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, I saw a very interesting question that I actually wanted to know as well um, from Amon. How do you deal with unhappy clients? Um, although I'm sure you don't have any unhappy clients and I hope you don't, but, um, and, and how do you decompress and handle the stress that comes with being a lawyer? Well, again, that, that's a great question because I, I don't think people recognize um, the amount of stress that's involved in the job. And, you know, often when young lawyers talk to me and they, they, they say, you know, what's the worst part of the job? Um, there is an extraordinary amount of, of stress that's put on your shoulders because when you're dealing with people, you're dealing with them in a time of crisis. And, and often it's one of the most significant um, moments of crisis a person will face in their life. And so much is at stake, freedom, their jobs, their family, all sorts of things are at issue. And so everything is riding on it. And that's an extraordinary burden for anyone to bear because you're dealing with people who are in a, a very distressed and desperate situation. And when you then go to court, you know, nobody's happy there either. <laughs> the witnesses aren't happy. It's a difficult experience for them. It is traumatic for them. And you know, you will do your job, but that is what you are surrounded with. That's where you go to work every day. That, that's what your job is every day. And that does um, take a toll. For sure it does. And, you know, I, I, I um, talked uh, about this with Christy, the late Christy Blatchford. She spent her life in courts and, you know, anybody, whether it's a police officer, crown, judge, um, journalist who's in the courts every day has that feeling. It, it's really a big weight. Um, and that is something you should think about because um, on a personal level, you cannot hang that up and, and just go home. It really, it, unfortunately, it is with you all the time. And that intrudes on a lot of things. And so that's something you should keep in mind. It's not like a real estate transaction that you can leave. And even civil litigation, I mean, you can get agitated about stuff, but it, you know, what is at stake and the amount of emotion, I think the only analogy probably would be family litigation, which is equally you're dealing with people in that sort of level of heightened emotional distress. 
how, how do I uh, decompress? Um, you know, th there's a few ways. I, I think you you decompress if you, definitely with your colleagues um, because you know you'll have the same sense of humor or you'll unload often what you're you're carrying and they know um, and you know and and you sort of you're able to to help each other through it. Um, that's one way. Uh, but the other way is obviously you have all sorts of other interests and you try the best you can to compartmentalize and, and sort of leave that sometimes uh, as much as you can. Uh, I will be honest and say, I find that very difficult. I'm not good at it um, and never have been good at it. But I, you know, if I'm, if people are at a 10, I'm probably at a 12 in terms of intensity level. That's just, again, the way I was made. Um, so I find it very hard to sort of leave the office and, and forget about it. Um, that's just, that's part of the price that you pay. I see. Thank you so much for that question. And thank you for that uh, great answer. Um, again, in the book, uh, Nothing But The Truth, you, you share a lot of insight into your life and the, your relationship with your family, um, even before you became a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you could go back to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give her to young Marie Hennon? <laughs> I think I would say lighten up and slow down a little bit. Um, so lighten up. I, I, as I said, I was always serious and super intense and completely obsessed academically. Um, so I don't know how many events I missed um, starting as early as elementary school. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's what it was. It was just the way I was made. And I would have liked to have told myself to just relax. My mom would tell me that, you know, my mom would, if she was here, she would say, uh, would argue with me to stop studying. Uh, because she'd say like, just relax, like you've done enough. And I never felt I had done enough. I wish I'd listened and relaxed a little bit. Um, and then I, I think the second thing is that I pushed through so quickly to get to law school that when I got there, I was 21. I had no clue about anything. I had zero life experience. And I think there was something about students that were more mature and they just had a better approach. And I think they enjoyed it so much more. Um, and I did not, I was just waiting to get out and to start practicing. And so I think I would have taken my time a little bit more. I would, I think there is a lot of value, not only yourself, but also to what you bring to the profession when you come at a much more, um, mature, uh, age with a, a bit more life experience. So th those are the two things that I think if I, uh, if I went back, I would, I would correct. I see, thank you. Um, we do have a few um, more minutes left with you. So if anyone does have any more questions, um, just feel free to uh, put that in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Um, I wanted to also speak about your mother a bit more as well. You talk about her a lot. She's a big influence on you. Um, and so you describe her as a, a staunch feminist. Um, and, and also how I remember you were explaining how you were going wedding shopping. Um, and, and so, and so um, the sort of person that was working there was saying that it's such a special moment for you and that your princess is getting married, you should be so proud. And your mom responded, no, I'm not proud of my daughter because she's getting married, proud of her when she graduated law school and got her master's. Um, but I'm happy for her if that's what makes her happy. So with that being said, you know, like you said, you call her this staunch feminist that's so determined to ensure your own independence um, and right. yet not fight like hell for her own. Would you consider yourself to be a feminist in your own right? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously, I, I think it's so obvious. It's not, it's evident, but you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a big fan of having to justify what I do or sort of demonstrate to someone that I, I have any label. My firm is what it is. I've lived my life the way I have. I have my career. Our firm is substantially female. Uh, you know, I think it is fairly clear what my views are. Um, and they are a, a function very much of my mother, who um, is absolutely, uh, you know, one, she is uncompromising. Yeah, I was telling somebody this yesterday. I mean, she's not read any books on feminism. She's the most uncompromising. There is no moment where her head isn't exploding when she's seeing this inequity. Like these hearings, uh, I mean, she, you can't calm her down about it. Like every single time 
um, I forget when it was, I think it was when Mitt Romney was running and for president. And he said at one point, um, you know, I, I've got women on my team and we let them go home to uh, at five o'clock to take care of their kids. And my mom was off the dial that he perceived that as being um, uh, promoting women. And that, you know, her comment was, why does he think we're the ones who have to be doing that? Like she just, she doesn't miss a moment where, you know, that's her, her lens. And I think it's because of the culture she came from and her own experience that she did not like, as I say, candidly in the, in the book that she resented the limitations put on her um, because she was female. And she felt that the way you would break through that, the only way to obtain your independence was to be educated and to have financial independence. And that in those, to quote her, you know, you will never ever rely on a man for anything. Um, and that for her was necessary um, and critical and important. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that reflected on me, obviously, it was uh, just the way I saw myself and it was very, very important to her. And, you know, my dad, again, we come from a, a pretty um, conservative culture was the, the, the least conservative person you'll ever meet. I mean, he just was so progressive and is so progressive um, in terms of, of, of me. And, uh, so I just, I just was really lucky to have that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question in the chat, if you wanted to answer that one as well. Sure. Um, so someone asks, how do you manage juries being swayed when presented with shocking, but insignificant information? And how are you able to distinguish important facts? Hmm. Well, that's that's a the how are you able to distinguish important facts is such a good question because um, not all facts are the same. Not all facts have the same important value. And as a lawyer, uh, one of the things you you are trying to identify is uh, what's key. And what's key is not only what's in your favor, but the important facts that are not in your favor because those are the ones you have to answer. Uh, I always tell uh, lawyers that if you go into a courtroom thinking you're the smartest person in the room and you're going to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, you probably should go home. Um, you should assume that the other side has not only matched you, but outmatched you and has thought of all of the things that are problematic. And your job is not to ignore them, but to figure out a way to address them, to deal with them. And so, you know, that is a great, great uh, question. Uh, when you are a lawyer, one of the most significant things you're doing when you've got this morass of facts is you're distilling. You're, you're, you're taking um, a, a massive uh, amount of information and you're beginning, after you've gone through it, you're sifting. So we always talk about that as being information uploaded in our office. You sort of take it all in and then you start filtering, filtering, filtering till you're down really uh, to the essence. And you know, if, if you see me do a three hour cross examination in court, I can tell you that some of those three hours have taken three months to prepare. So you can imagine what I've started with and how tight it is by the time you've got your, your distilled three hours. So that is part of instinct, but part of experience as well to learn what is and is not important. One of the most significant qualities of a really good appellate and trial lawyer. Um, in terms of how do you manage juries being swayed, uh, well, that's that's a problem, really, when you're dealing with um, shocking or disturbing information. And that's one of the considerations that would be in play as to whether you proceed to a jury trial or a judge alone trial, because judges have seen it all before, uh, whereas a jury um, can be quite um, impacted by those sorts of things. Uh, so I think it depends on what the shocking information is and, and whether you think it would be um, very difficult to overcome. Thank you so, so much, Marie. Can we expect any more books from you in the future or not? Maybe, okay. <laughs> well, well, we'll definitely be here for it. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. And thank you to the audience as well. And I speak on behalf of the entire LBSA um, to say thank you. This is our actually last event of the academic year. So this meant so, so much. Um, you're you. such an influential, amazing person to so many of thank us you. here. Um, um, we are gonna let you go though. And for the rest of the audience, you can. we're gonna have a 
five minute break, uh, Kathleen, and then we're gonna get to some of our usual programming and just talk about um, the, the book itself and really get into that. But thank you so much, Marie. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and I hope some of you join me in this uh, in the profession, and I hope you find it as fulfilling. And if I haven't gotten to your questions, I'm not hard to find. Just go on our website and uh, shoot a note to me, and I, I actually do always answer. So um, hopefully I cross paths in the future with all of you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Marie. Bye. Okay, so like we said, we're just going to take a quick five-minute break, and we'll be back at 7.30.